I've kind of got a, a bit to live up to. I mean, I'm not really abolishing child uh, poverty or <laughs> advocating for human rights. I'm just keeping bees. But um, <laughs> so you're probably wondering why I have the birds and the bees as my first slide. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. And I know a 15-year-old can't talk about the birds and the bees, but it's not what you think. It's, <laughs> it's chickens and a few ducks and then a lot, a lot, a lot of bees. Um, so, um, yes, as Duke mentioned, um, I'm Oren Fox. I'm a sophomore at uh, the Thatcher School. Um, hello. And, uh, yes, I'm 15, and, I, and the little count right now is uh, 35 chickens, four ducks, and uh, seven beehives. Um, so I, I kind of started by getting a few beehives at home. Currently, I have um, four back east. And uh, about a week ago, we had four at school, except on Sunday, we realized that one of them uh, didn't, or we had three at school, and we realized that one of them didn't really make it. So the count is actually down to six beehives, unfortunately. It's just how it happens. Um, some survive, some don't. Um, but actually, just to start off with a quick little video that um, Michael Piazza, who's somewhere in the audience, made, um, made this summer. Uh, so it's just a cool little way to start off. I mean, they're smart little creatures. They're a lot different than uh, many other animals, but they're pretty intelligent. <laughs> simple level, the bees are much more independent. You definitely do not have to visit them every day, and they kind of do what they need. Only when the hive is kind of in a time of need are you really called upon to help them out. Even though it's not your own work, you kind of feel like it is because it's just cool to see your own hive thriving and you know bees going everywhere, pollen coming in and out, honey being packed away. You kind of have to realize that you're working with them and they're working with you. It's not a one-way street. Honey is really, mainly what it is, is dehydrated nectar. Wildflower honey is really just any, any flower in the vicinity of the beehives that they decide to collect. So you will get purple loosestrife, peaches, apples, kind of all that good stuff um, just from around the area. Learning where your food comes from kind of makes you more aware to possibilities. You learn that food doesn't just come in plastic bottles and just arrive at the grocery store, that it has to be grown or produced or harvested or gathered, however you want to put it. Nowadays, a lot of people are a little too skeptical about things, and I have to say, just go for it, because if you always look at the negative effects, it's, it usually can overpower the positive effects, but if you just kind of say, all right, well, we've discussed it a lot, but yeah, let's just get bees, and you get a few hives, and then you're just rolling with them, you'll realize how great they are. My name is Arn Fox. This is my third year keeping bees, and what else do I have to say? Um, yeah, so that's just a pretty cool little video. Um, some really nice shots of the bees pollinating. So they're pretty hard to get because they're small little creatures. They're hard to find. But um, so here are some pictures um, of me when I first got started with chickens. Um, this is even before I had any of my own birds. But um, I kind of started out by um, 
So there's this, there's this little local farm where my chickens are currently, which is um, only a few miles away from my house. And I would go every Saturday to, um, to help out at the farm. I would feed the chickens. And it's, it's not that big. There's maybe a uh, hundred chickens there. And so I'd collect the eggs, which in and of itself was the greatest thing on earth. And I would give the chickens food and water and, um, you know, just do various chores that, uh, that I thought were absolutely great. And it's kind of funny because as I mentioned, I went over every Saturday morning and I'd usually go over at nine o'clock, which now is, is quite early. And back then I'd wake up at about six and just jump around ready to go. Um, and so, I mean, that was really a blast. Um, but even before I got my birds. Uh, so this is um, one of my original dozen birds that I got. Uh, her name is Josephine. And um, yeah, this is just a cute picture of when she was a chick. Uh, and so uh, when, they, when I first got my birds, uh, I kept them uh, in my house because you got to keep them nice and warm. And it's really easy to kind of check in on them and uh, just see how they're doing. And so I would always, and like when I would get home from school, I'd carry them around and kind of like snuggle with them. And so as I was trying to do my homework, they would come try to do it as well as they're um, showing here. And this next, this, so I would spend a bunch of time um, on the weekends kind of working with the birds and doing other various things around the farm. And so I was just kind of tired, so I lay down to take a snooze. And so these little, these two little ducks had, um, they'd come kind of later in the spring and I just thought they were super cute. So I would pet them and give them food and water every day. And, uh, I just thought they were really awesome. And they eventually, I think they thought I was their mother. So they would follow me around. And so after I kind of took a little snooze, I woke up and they were sleeping right there too. Uh, so they, I, mean, they, I felt kind of bad as I was cruising around and they'd be running behind to try to keep up. Um, it's another just adorable picture of when chickens are chicks and they're still very cute, as they are when they grow up, but they're just the best when they're younger. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> this is one of my birds. Um, her name is uh, Sugar. She's not around anymore, but uh, she would always also follow me around. And there, um, a lot of people don't under, uh, realize that there's kind of the two big categories of chickens are sort of the standard chicken and the little bantam chicken. And no matter how big she looks, her body was really only about this big. She's had a bunch of uh, feathers. So she would also kind of run around and follow me. And her legs are two inches long. So as she's trying to sprint to keep up is kind of a, a, a funny little um, sight. Uh, so this is kind of just a funny picture. It's sort of, uh, so the farm where all the chickens are is uh, named Oak Valley Farm. and this. It's kind of our little cross country team, uh, you know, all just running around. Um, and, uh, and so the chickens were really, they were kind of cool. They taught me really just about responsibility because at the time, no one else in my grade really had a responsibility quite like I did, having a dozen chickens that I had to care for every day after school. So when a buddy would say, oh, do you want to come over and hang out like right after school? I'd say, well, no, I can come over in an hour, though, once I'm done taking care of the chickens. So, and it wasn't really something I could just ignore. I mean, they need food and they need water just like we do. So, I mean, I had to go every single day and there was no, oh, well, maybe tomorrow. I mean, I had to really go and do it. No matter <laughs> how cold it was in the winter, um, there's some pretty brutal times and it obviously, on the East Coast, it can get dark at like 4.30, really in the dead of winter. So I'd be trudging through snow and feel like the worst thing ever. And then you get into the barn and there's like a million birds around you all talking. It's just really great. And it kind of is why I do it. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, Alice. Uh, and I got her kind of at a, uh, at a little local fair. And I, I didn't really... I wasn't planning on getting any birds, um, except then I, I just kind of saw this little row of about a dozen birds that looked exactly like her, and they were just, they were the cutest little things. I mean, she, it's hard to tell, but she's also only like this big. Um, and so uh, as, as I brought her back to the barn, a lot of people kind of caught on to her sort of fiery personality. Like, if you go into the barn, she knows you're there, and she 
she won't let you walk by without talking a little bit. Um, and she's so small that uh, in the winter, I would, I would think that she was shivering. I'm sure she was really fine. And so if I would ever go over in a sweatshirt, you know, sweatshirt pockets can be kind of big. And so I just tuck her in and she would just sleep as I was doing whatever I was doing. And she would just sit there and then I'd, I'd take her back out and she'd wake up and walk off. But um, so I could always have one of the birds kind of with me, which is uh, pretty sweet. Um, yeah, there she is again. Can't have enough pictures of her. And then those are the two little ducks. Uh, and it, what actually is happening is there's, a, there's a, obviously a hose there for the water, and they love to get squirted in the face with the hose. Um, and so we're just misting them on a hot summer day, and they really loved it, the swimming and everything. Um, it was really all great. And this is sugar again. And yes, we are in church in that picture. <laughs> and, and so my family, we don't really go to church um, kind of every Sunday, but... One of our good neighbors is having this, um, this event, kind of, it's called the Blessing of the Animals, where people would bring you know, the typical dogs, cats, and then I would show up with half a dozen chickens. <laughs> and so and we had a little um, kind of pewed ourselves and we'd put down a towel, so if there was a bathroom break, it would all kind of stay contained. Uh, and on the other side of her are all her friends lined up. Um, but, uh, and just another picture. She's really great. Um, although, it was kind of sad. So obviously, when you get chickens, it's, it's great. And it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. Uh, like, when I picked up my first dozen birds, I couldn't stop, like, talking to them. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I would hold them. And at one point, I had about, I think I had 11 of the dozen in my arms. And there was one left. And I was trying to pick her up and hold her, too, without dropping the five others that were in the arms. So... Um, but yeah, and so it's really great when you get them and there's about, there's, there's about a million great things that happen except for occasionally they die, which is, is really a bummer, but um, there's this kind of this cool story of this one rooster I had um, who really was a sweetheart. He was super nice and friendly and everyone loved him. And he died and I was super bummed and I didn't really want to bury him because that's always kind of a sad process, seeing their little stiff bodies being buried. Um, but so my dad, he went, um, he was going to bury her, or him, and obviously put a little food and water in just, you know, for good measure. And he said that, so he was burying her kind of at night, and, or him, and he said that, like, as, right before he did bury him, there was, like, a really bright star in the sky, and after he finished burying him, it was gone. So it's kind of cool to think that it like went with him. I'm sure it was probably just a really big cloud, but it's still <laughs> nice to think that, uh, that there's kind of a little special something there. And so uh, these are two more of um, some pretty fluffy little animals. You can see their, their legs actually have feathers all the way down. They're, um, they're pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, I, I kind of I started by volunteering and getting to know kind of um, how it was all done and uh, and so I got my first chickens uh, when I was pretty young. Um, obviously made a ton of mistakes, but it was okay because I was just beginning, so it was really it really was kind of excusable. And as long as it wasn't affecting any of the chickens negatively, that was really fine. Like I mean, the mistakes I was making were like forgetting to close the door and then there was just a jailbreak which <laughs> took an extra half an hour to catch them all. Um, and so I, I, I started by writing a little journal entry about every day. Um, and I really started when, I, when they were little chicks. And I wasn't writing about anything really because they're just chicks and nothing was really going on because in the first week, yeah, they grow, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't really notice it. And so all I was saying was like, this chicken looks like she's going to be like really big, and this one looks like she's going to be really small. I mean, really pretty trivial stuff. Um, but so uh, people were interested in what I was writing, so they suggested I start a blog. And the blog has kind of, kind of almost sort of brought me to here where I am now because um, a lot of people have caught on. I've started to post various things, not only what, um, what I was kind of thinking, but also some cool little articles I found. And it actually ended up taking me to the White House. Uh, just a little blog, but um, so here's some pictures. So 
there's a little conference um is called know your farmer know your food um and it was uh held in the um eisenhower building i think uh which is right next to the white house and um so i got invited to attend um it was really cool there's a bunch of people packed in this room there was uh some pretty well-known people like um not in any of these pictures but there was uh kathleen merrigan who is the um she was kind of one of the big dogs in terms of agriculture um uh, i can't remember her specific title but then the <laughs> the bald guy in the upper right corner that's sam cass who's actually the white house executive chef and the whole event was being televised and so i was really hoping i wouldn't have to say anything and just and a few minutes after he arrived he just stood up and asked if there was a beekeeper in the audience who is like i think let's see i was in yeah he said is there a freshman beekeeper in the audience and there's no one else really even near my age so <laughs> i stood up and i shook his hand I, I got to talk to him for a little bit um which kind of ended with uh, my dad and I getting a little tour of the White House. And we were walking through the White House and the president was like in a room. He was having a meeting with like the prime minister of Israel. So we didn't get to meet him, but <laughs> we were still 50 yards away from the president um, walking by guys with like huge guns, didn't want to look us in the eye. They were just, uh, and so, um, so this is when I first got, when I got my first, bees and i planned on having two hives but when i arrived uh, it turns out well we had they had the two hives all set up that there is um a man who's at the last second his wife said no you can't get bees but he'd ordered everything and he had his hive all set up so it turned out instead of we came with um the intention of getting two hives and actually ended uh ended up with three which was really it wasn't really anything bad it was just all for the better because i could you know compare the the various hives uh, together because each one is a lot different. Um, and so this is what the bees come in, kind of a, um, a box with four sides and then, uh, and then screen on the other two. And the bees kind of come in this big wad uh, because there's like a can of sugar water that they all suck out of. That's what they're really hanging on in that picture. Um, and so the bees made a really cool sound when when they were in their little uh, little boxes, they were just kind of humming. And so I put one of the packages in my room because it was like a soothing sound. And so yes, uh, I was sleeping there with my bees and there's my cat as well. Uh, and so it was just, it was just kind of cool because I was so excited to get them started that I couldn't let them, I couldn't go anywhere without having the bees like literally in my hands. So I had to sleep with them. Um, <laughs> And this is kind of going out to the hives. Uh, they're kind of tucked away um, in a nice little spot right on the woods. There they are lined up, um, looking in really nice condition because that's right when they all started, they're all clean and they look great. And over the years, they'll get really kind of beat up. Um, and so it's actually kind of cool. Um, so someone uh, who tasted the honey described it as Peaches, apples, and the Atlantic Ocean is kind of a poetic way of describing it. Also makes it sound really delicious. Um, so actually, I think it's kind of been around. Uh, so I did bring a little bit of this honey for all of you to taste. Uh, and so you have some little spoons so it can get passed around as I'm finishing this up. And it's pretty delicious. And the kind of, you'll see that it kind of has a cloudy color to it, um, which isn't anything bad. It's just that the honey, when we harvested it, it got a little crystallized, and that's really all that it is, so it can kind of change the texture and uh, what it looks like. Um, obviously a guard bee coming to check out who was destroying their hive, or so it appeared. Um, you know, another little cute bee. Um, all the bees watching. Uh, and so, yeah, so these two people right here, um, so you probably are wondering how I got started with bees. And um, for my birthday one year, I, well, so it kind of all started um, by, I, once I got my chickens, people encouraged me to enter them in um, the Topsfield Fair, which is a fair um, back near my house. And so I did and actually had quite a, a fair amount of success with just entering my birds. I really had no idea what I was doing. And so I met um, a bunch of cool people. I saw... Uh, I mean, there are also like sheep shows and I could see um, the bee barn as well. 
and I decided along the way that I wanted a ram for my birthday. So I asked for a ram and, um, and to go to bee school, which is what I heard about. It's a way to kind of get started with bees and um, sort of learn about them. And the ram didn't happen, but the bee school did. Uh, and so this is kind of um, checking them out a little bit. Um, and yeah, one thing I kind of uh, didn't really touch upon, but while I was at the White House, uh, the, the chef, Sam Cass, challenged me to a honey off with the White House. Um, so, uh, so it turns out, so I sent them some of my honey, and they sent us some of theirs. And so, I mean, it's kind, it was kind of, kind of surreal when he says, oh, do you want to have a honey off? And I was like, you want my honey to go to, to the White House? I mean, it just, the entire thing was kind of, seemed a little ridiculous, but it's it really cool. I mean, I can say I had a honey off at the White House. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, and uh, let's see. And so I, when I started, um, I started by getting them at home, obviously, first. And then I got three hives at school, which, uh, which has in, been an interesting process because we got two to start off. And there's a really nice beekeeper who lives in Ojai, where, um, where I go to school, who helps us out. And so we had our original two hives. And he brought a third hive that he said... Um, so he was working with someone else, and their bees had gone away, and he'd never bothered to take the actual physical hive back home. So he'd left it out, and somewhere along the way, some wild bees have moved in. They were, they were still just um, normal honeybees, but they turned, about, turned out to be super aggressive. And actually, as we were putting them in with the other two beehives, uh, I, I let some of my other friends go in with the suits, and I was standing away with, um, with one of the teachers. We were a safe distance. I mean. 50 or 60 yards away, and those wild anger bees came over, and we all got stung, even the people in the suits, because they took them off um, after a few minutes, but the bees were still around. It was, I mean, it was just really kind of a nasty hive, but um, this is just one of the mellow, nice ones at home, and now that crazy hive has realized that um, it has, has remembered what it's like to have a beekeeper tending to them, so they've kind of mellowed out um, now when we go to take care of them. Obviously, bees need water, and this is just a sweet little picture of them drinking out of a little puddle. Um, and it does entail uh, kind of clearing out the hives in the winter. As you can see, um, it's kind of hard, but there's a little black tar paper wrapped around, which attracts the sunlight and keeps the hive rel relatively warm. Um, but as you can see, they kind of got snowed in. So, um, you know, it does involve digging out the fronts of the hives so that it doesn't get too wet inside. And there's kind of there's work year round, but it's not daily work because the bees are pretty. Um, as I mentioned in the video, they're pretty self-sustaining. So uh, I mean, it's just basic needs, and this is ver um, one of them. Uh, yep, see, snowed in at the front, and those are actually little dead bees who made it out and didn't make it back in because uh, of the snow. Um, and <laughs> so at the bottom of every hive, there's this thing um, that allows the bees to land, and it kind of um, it's literally just called the landing board, so as they come cruising in full of honey, they have a place to kind of crash land and then crawl up. But it leaves a gap under the hive, and it turned out that, um, that the mice had discovered this nice little gap that was kept warm by the bees, so why not move in in the winter, which is exactly what happened. Under, um, the, there was one hive that didn't make it through the winter, and as my dad and I were cleaning it out in the spring we picked it up and about 60 baby mice just scurried out and it was really it was really kind of disgusting because it's just there's mice and it's a mouse house and mouse houses aren't really the cleanest places so that was that was a bit of an interesting experience um and so while that didn't smell good working with bees i mean it really does like that's uh all honeycomb and unfortunately th this is a picture of bees that ran out of honey. And as you can see, they're all, those are all their tails, or their butts, and they were reaching in to get honey and there wasn't any there, so they uh, couldn't make it out. Kind of a sad picture, but um, it's just what happens. And there is, there's a little picture of the top of the hives. Um, and yeah, so as I mentioned before, working with them on a hot summer day, you really smell everything and that's kind of a really cool experience when you open the hive up and all the bees come out and it just smells great which is one of the reasons why I love um, I love caring for them and these are this is um, down in Ojai those are the three little hives 
Um, and this is the day we set up a little electric fence around the hives because um, there are many predators that live in those hills who would love to have a little um, midnight snack of honey. So we had to keep them out. Um, and that's the kind of little bee crew that we assembled, which is uh, a real blast to work with, um, opening up some of the hives at school. And this is all um, honey that's been packed away, and that white stuff is, is just wax that they've capped the honey away with. So that's really ready for use in the winter. Um, and you use it, um, I mean, I could talk, I'll talk to you about this later if you'd like, but there's various ways that the bees store honey for themselves, and when you want honey, um, they store it for you. It sounds kind of ridiculous, but it's really true. And this is all packed away for them. Um, again, just a beautiful shot of the honey. Harvesting it, it's actually a really great experience. Although everything gets sticky and literally everything. You won't, I mean, you try to keep it off your clothes, but at some point it's going to get on your hand and you're going to wipe your face and then you have honey on your face. You're going to try to wipe it off and then you're going to see it on your, and it just gets everywhere. Um, <laughs> But it's really worth it in the end because it's pretty delicious. Um, just have a little, uh, see this honey, it's that kind of cloudy color. It's because it was crystallized. Barefoot beekeeper as I'm going now because in the summer it's, it's a bit of a hassle to put on sneakers and I haven't really been stung um, a terrible amount on my feet so there's really no reason to put shoes on. Uh, but yeah, so I, People always ask me kind of um, if they had suggestions, if, if I had suggestions for them on how to get bees, how they would go about it. And like I mentioned in the video, um, yes, you'll think about like, oh, well, I'll have to go in the winter. Well, it's not a problem here, but if you live back on the East Coast, I'll have to go in the winter and clean out the snow, um, you know, visit them fairly often. I have to kind of understand what's going on in the hive to keep them healthy. But you can't really think about that. You just have to think about how delicious it would be to have honey. Uh, and so I, I always encourage people to just think about how great having bees, for example, would be and, uh, and just all the positives because people can tend to weigh in on the negatives too much and not look, about, look at how, how great bees could really be. Um, and I've failed numerous times. I mean, hives have died. Obviously, the mice moved in. That was just all a disaster. I've had many things go wrong, but in the end, things will kind of reverse themselves and they'll go right. Um, and even though, like, I was afraid of getting my first hives because, I mean, I'm going to get stung and there's things that are going to go wrong, but you can't, you, I mean, you have to think about that, but think about how great it's going to be to have honey. I mean, that's just really the greatest thing. And, and having bees all around, they're really, really cool and pollinators. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of it. It's just bees are a really great thing, and as I've mentioned before, they they produce a really delicious thing called honey. <laughs>